Hey guys, happy Wednesday. It's Sierra here. Hope you guys had a fabulous holiday season. Just wanted to give you a quick little announcement before the episode starts. Ashley and I were um, just really exhausted and overwhelmed with Christmas and podcastmas and everything we had going on. So this week's episode we're releasing is one of our bonus episodes from the Patreon, and we'll be back next week with a fresh case for you guys, but this is one you've never heard. Well, from us anyway. So hope you enjoy it, and to all of our pepperoni patronies, you can head on over to Patreon. This week we'll have a bonus episode ready for you, um, and we're going to record another one this week, so we'll have another one next week. Can't wait to see you next week. And anyway, here it is. Bye, guys. Hello, everyone. I'm Sierra. And I'm Ashley. And this is your Patreon-exclusive Weekly Weekly Dose of Wicked. Hello, Pepperoni Patronis! Cute little... Pepperonis. Alrighty, so I got a little quickie for you today. Ooh, I love quickies. <laughs> I knew you would. So I'm just going to jump right in, right? I don't think we have anything to discuss since this is a yeah. bonus episode. Our pepperoni patronis don't have to be bored by us begging. Although if you are in the Patron, the Patron, if you're in the Patron, <laughs> <laughs> the Patreon, if you're in my margarita, if you're in the Patreon <laughs> and you have not given us a rating or a review or I mean a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts, what are you doing with your life? Get over there. Do it. Do it now. I'm just kidding. You do whatever you want, you beautiful little people. <laughs> but we would love it if you did. Anyway, go ahead. All righty. So let's just jump on in. So on May 6th of 1996, Cher Renee Guess Daly, 35, left her home in Ventura, California to run some errands and never returned. Well, that's unfortunate. That is unfortunate for Sherry. Sherry was born on February 2nd, 1961. Her family and her friends described her as quiet, reserved, sweet, generous, and kind-hearted. She owned a local child care center with a business partner and her friend and was loved by her community. She married her high school sweetheart. What? I didn't say anything. You, you like, put your hand up, it looked like. Like, you were like, pause. No, I was. (laughs) No, I was enjoying my glass of wine. (laughs) That was the face of pure enjoyment. Okay. I'm glad. Anyways, she married her high school sweetheart, Michael Daly, in 1982. Michael was very popular and was a player in high school, but changed his ways when he met Sherry. Sure he did. Of course, because that's how it works, right? They quickly grew inseparable. After high school, they moved in together, got married. Six years later, in 1988, they welcomed their first child, a sweet baby boy, and one year later, another baby boy. Sherry worked part-time at her child care center, and Michael was the manager at a grocery store. They lived the perfect suburban life. After Michael got home from work that day and Sherry hadn't returned home in hours, he reported her missing. Michael called the cops and they told him that it was too early and he needed to give it 72 hours to determine that she was really missing and didn't just, you know, take a little vacation, go away for the day, whatever you do when you go missing. I freaking hate it when they say that. My God almighty. Yeah, super annoying. Why do they do that? Oh, my wife's missing. Nah, she just took a little vacation. Yeah. She just left you with your two kids. No big deal. So they said that after that 72 window was over to call him back and make a report if she really was missing. Michael didn't like this advice, so he started a search of his own. He rallied together his whole community, all of his friends, their family, and Sherry was super loved in their community. So there was a huge civilian search launched. So that's pretty badass on Michael. Um, I agree. I feel feel bad now for saying he didn't change his player ways. (laughs) You should. So during the search... Um, They found that Sherry's car was abandoned in a Target parking lot. Michael knew the police were wrong, so he once again contacted them to report his wife missing, and they started off with the same, it's too early, and he was like, no, you don't understand. Something's wrong. We found her car. You have to help. So the police took him seriously, and they arrived at the scene to find her car with the keys still in the ignition, her purse on the floorboard, her ID on the passenger seat, and all of the items that she had purchased that day still in her trunk. Good for Michael for being a squeaky wheel. Yes. Squeaky wheel gets the oil. So the police take it seriously. They launch an investigation in her disappearance with the assumption that foul play was in fact involved. They would have just listened to Michael in the first place, but whatever. After questioning shoppers at Target and workers at Target, 
They found out that Sherry was last seen around 9.30 a.m. loading her bags into her car when she was approached by a blonde woman. They had a short conversation. Sherry was handcuffed and put into an unmarked cop car. What? Yes. So this was a cop? Yep. That's what it seems. I call bull squash. It is bull squash. There were no reports of any kind by any surrounding police departments of any arrest on Sherry Dally. So this means that Sherry was kidnapped by someone impersonating a police officer. It's pretty crazy. I was not expecting that turn of events. <laughs> it, it was quite the turn of events. And they continue to be turn of events. So just hold on to your britches. I'm not wearing any. I'm just joking. That was weird. Okay, <laughs> no one joking. wanted to I get have pants that. on. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what to say to that. Anyway, <laughs> I was just joking. I'm wearing pants and underwear. It was just a okay, joke. Good. I'm wearing my good rainbow pajama pants. Okay, nice. And then I got it all day. Not sponsored. Okay, good for you. <laughs> Though we should be because we love Aldi. Yeah, we should be. If anything, I'm drinking my Aldi wine. Wear my Aldi pajamas. I don't have any. Well, I have an Aldi bag next to me. But I don't have any Aldi, I have my Aldi pajamas on. I'm drinking my Aldi wine. Um, I think my underwear that I'm wearing are from Aldi. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> pretty much it all right continue nobody cares about aldi sorry no probably not okay so per usual police start their investigation with the spouse but michael was cleared he had an alibi he was at work at the time of sherry's kidnapping and he was super helpful to the police he launched the initial search for sherry which found her car he answered all of their questions he did everything he could to help find his way right. he even held a press conference with the news that he organized himself begging the community to come forward with any information he was just the perfect grieving husband the way you say that makes me suspicious of him again. <laughs> it's because you like to guess who did it. Just sit back and enjoy the ride. I can't. I feel like I'm flying in a flying death trap of a vehicle every time you tell me a story. That's because that's how I write them. Because I like them to be that way. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's exactly my goal. It's like, hmm, what's going to make Sierra feel like she's dying listening to my story? How am I going to make Sierra feel uncomfortable? I'm going to write this like she's flying 95 miles per hour down the interstate in a car that's on fire. Thank you. Yes, that's exactly what I do. You nailed it on the head. Thank you. I love it when you do that. Continue. So since they've cleared Michael, they went on to try to identify the blonde fake cop. They couldn't identify her right away, but they did find the car that she drove off in. It was a blue Nissan sedan. Um, Something said an Altima. Something said... I didn't write what the other one is called. What's the other one? It's just like an Altima. Awesome yeah. Okay, well, anyways, it doesn't matter. It's a blue Nissan. Sedan. So they found the car at a local car rental business. And the man working the counter had remembered a blonde woman renting the car for about two days in May. After pulling the records, they found that the car was rented on May 5th and returned on May 7th by a woman, by a woman named Diana Hahn. The police searched the car and they found blood stains in the back of the car that appeared to be attempted to be cleaned and the blood in the car matched sherry's when the police went to talk to diana at her house they were greeted with diana in lingerie with none other than michael daly oh, behind her in his the own. husband the husband what a piece of shit so it turns out sherry and michael did not have the perfect life that they portrayed michael and diana have been having an affair for two years now they met at the grocery store that they both worked at michael was the manager and diana worked in the deli their relationship started off as just superficial flirting, but quickly became much more. They bonded over their heritage. Can you pause for a second? Yes. How stupid are you when the cops show up at the house of your girlfriend to walk up to the door in your underwear? Right. Fucking idiot. Yeah, I know. <laughs> She's in lingerie and he's in underwear. Like, come on, dude. What a piece of garbage. Yeah. Like, first of all, if you want to save yourself, put your clothes on and be like, guys, I found her. This is who killed my wife. I had no relationship with her whatsoever. She's a lunatic. <laughs> right. But instead, he's like, oh, hey, 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 in my underwear with the person who most likely murdered my wife. Yeah. Fucking I mean, idiot. Okay. Idiot. Turns out Sherry and Michael did not have quite the perfect life that they portrayed. Michael and Diana have been having an affair for two years. They met at the grocery store they both worked at. Michael was the manager and Diana worked in the deli. Their relationship started off as just superficial flirting, but quickly became much more. They bonded over their heritage. Both Michael and Diana were part Japanese on their mother's side. And their father were ser American servicemen. So that was something that caused them a lot of issues in their younger lives. So they really bonded over that. Noted. Keep my husband away from women that are 132nd Korean. <laughs> 
Well, I said Japanese, but whatever. I know, but they, they bonded over their heritage, so I gotta keep my husband away from the people that oh, are 132nd right, right, right. Korean, since, you know, he's Korean. I understand your joke now. I was like, no, see, I said Japanese. <laughs> I think he's actually 116th. Yeah. Okay, well. Right? We've done either that way, before, right? I don't know what he is. Either way, keep him away from the Koreans. Yes. Not that I dislike Koreans. I have no problem with Koreans, but I don't want to get murdered by my husband and his Korean girlfriend. Yeah, no, don't want to do that. So Diana was a wannabe fashion model. She hadn't always been the beautiful, confident woman that she was now. In high school, Diana was an outsider and was quite lonely. She didn't fit in with the pretty blonde valley girls she went to school with. But at 15, she had an accident in gym class where the basketball backboard had fallen on her and almost killed her. It put her in the intensive care unit. And that experience really changed Diana. She went to work to better herself. She gave herself a makeover and pushed herself to become outgoing. With her new look inside and out, she quickly grew popular and started pursuing her dreams of being a fashion model. Initially, she booked quite a few jobs, but they quickly grew far and few between. After she graduated high school, she continued her education at Oxford College. There, she still continued to pour herself into her dream. She took smaller, odd jobs so she could work around her modeling jobs, like being a waitress, a bank teller, working at grocery stores, things like that. When she knew her modeling career wasn't likely to happen in her 30s, she got a full-time job at the grocery store deli, and that's where she met Michael. So Michael and Sherry were at a rough point in their marriage. Michael was the main breadwinner in their marriage. Sherry only worked part-time so she could take care of their young children, and it was really putting a strain on Michael. He was really struggling with the stress of living paycheck to paycheck and trying to keep up their social lifestyle. To deal with this stress, he needed excitement in his life. Poor Michael. Poor little baby. Yeah, I know. I know. Sucks to be him. So he started flirting with Diana. Such a hard life. I know. He's the victim here. So their initial flirting developed into makeout sessions in the stockroom, which then developed into a full-on affair. They kept this relationship a secret for six months, and then Diana got sick of being the other woman, and Michael got sick of lying. So he told Sherry that he met someone else and he was in love with her. He told her that he was moving out and in with his girlfriend, Diana. Oh. Their relationship started off great. All the excitement he could ask for. Lots of sex, lots of partying, great time. But his new lifestyle came with a price. He had to support himself and Diana's wild life that they were living and his wife and kid's life. He thought he was under financial pressure before, but he was really feeling the strain now. He was having to support two lives. Well, no shit. That's what happens. Yeah, that's why you... Um, when you leave your wife for your mistress. Yes, that's why you don't do that. So the only solution for Michael was back to... Michael didn't really want this. He never actually stopped seeing Diana. He was flaunting his relationship in front of Sherry. He even got a pillowcase made with Diana's face on it and slept with it every night. In front of Sherry. What the fuck? Yeah, trash bag. What a lunatic. If my husband... Okay, first of all, no, not even. I can't even admit that on the podcast in case it happens. <laughs> it's the Patreon. We're all friends here. No one's going to tell me. If my husband... First of all, if he cheated on me, penis is gone. <laughs> well, second of all, if he thinks he's going to sleep in bed next to me with a pillowcase of another woman's face... Yeah. He's got another freaking thing coming. Yeah. But Sherry really wanted things to work out. She did everything she could. She tried to work on herself work on their marriage, try to get them to go to counseling. There was even one article that I read that said that one day while he was at work to make him happy, she washed and waxed his car for him. Like, she was just doing everything she could to try to get their marriage to work out. No, Sherry. Fuck him. Well, clearly she needed to be kissing his ass since he's killing her. Okay, well, she doesn't know that yet. And you don't know that yet. I do know that. He was in underwear. <laughs> he was in underwear. He has to be the murderer. Obviously. So, with their relationship just being rubbed in Sherry's face, she just grew enraged. If Michael wouldn't come to his senses on his own, maybe it would help if Sherry reached out to Diana. So, she showed up at the market that they both worked at, and it was quite the confrontation. They were yelling at each other in the parking lot, and witnesses say that Sherry threatened Diana with telling her to stay away from her family or else. I mean, I gotta say, that'd probably be the first thing I'd do. Yeah, probably. I probably wouldn't have um, worked on my marriage until I told Diana to screw off. That would have been the first step there. I mean, I'm not saying it's Diana's fault. I mean, they're both at fault. But, I mean, I hate, like, when there's, like, a infidelity and we, like, just blame the mistress. Because, like, you never know the story that the piece of trash is telling Right, her. but it's not working to talk to Michael, so... 
tell Diana to screw off. I mean, I would just go talk to Diana and be like, hey, I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, we're married. I'm the wife. If you could please stay away from my husband, that would be ideal. And at that point, if she says no, then tell her to screw off. Yeah, well, clearly she knew that he was married and had a family since he left them to come be with her. Yeah, true. And then moved back in with the family, but then continued to be with her. True. So she knew, she knew that it was going on. I mean, either way, he's trash bag. Yes. They're both She's trash, trash too. They're both trash. So with this affair and Diana's name being used to rent the car, she was the number one suspect. Obviously. <laughs> Obviously. Um, but Diana says that her checkbook was stolen days before Sherry went missing. What a convenience that somebody stole her checkbook and then murdered Sherry in the trunk of the car. Yeah. So she says her checkbook was stolen and that she had by for the day that Sherry disappeared. She went on a long bike ride from Ventura to Camarillo. I think that's how you say that. What a stupid story. Yep. So that's about an hour and 45 minutes one way. And then she spent some time at the beach sunbathing. And then she came home. When she was on her bike ride, her tire hit some gravel and she had a small accident. So she got a cut on her forehead. So that's where that cut came from. Gotcha. It's from her bike ride. Makes sense. Could it possibly be from the struggle she had with Cherry? No. Mm -mm. Nope. It's from the bike ride and the small accident she had. Okay. Um, most sources that I found said that she was alone during the day trip. However, her sister testified in court and said that Diana went on a bike ride and had a beach day. But I didn't see anything where her sister was actually on the trip. So I don't know why she got to testify that that occurred. I don't know why either, because, like, let's be honest. If you call me up and you're like, yo, Holmes, I just murdered my boyfriend's wife, I'd be like, yeah, man, Ashley was on a beach trip. I was there with her all day. <laughs> right. So, yeah, okay. Okay, but she didn't say that she was with her in anything that I found. She just said that she could testify that Diana went on the beach trip by herself. Was it, like, the type of situation? Okay, so, like, let's say, like, you are accused of murder. And they're like, hey, we need a testimony. And I could be like, I have Ashley's location and I monitor it all day. And I can assure you she was at the beach. I mean, possibly, but this was in 96. So, no. Got it. Okay. So, no location <laughs> sharing. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> So anyways, um, Diana was super cooperative with the police. She answered all their questions. At first, she's doing super well with the interrogation, but she becomes worn down. She gets shaky and emotional, and she just wants Michael. Poor baby. They held her. I know. Poor girl. They held her on their suspicion for as long as they legally could, but with no actual evidence, they had to release her. They don't have actual evidence. She rented the car with the victim's blood in it. Okay, yes. But she says her checkbook was stolen. It's a good thing I'm not a detective, because so I'll just be like, you're lying. Jolly whop your ass. <laughs> that wouldn't work, so. That's why I'm just a podcaster. Yes. Just a podcaster. That's all we are. Measly little podcasters. Dude, this podcast is award-winning. <laughs> Three weeks into the search for Sherry, a body was found in a ravine in a remote wooded area. It was a horrifying and repulsive scene. Even the most seasoned detectives on the case were deeply disturbed by the gruesome state of the body. There were several stab wounds to the chest. The head was almost severed from the body. Numerous broken bones and the spinal cord was severed. Uh, the body was identified as Sherry. And the cause of death was being blagooned by an axe. She was blagooned? Blagooned. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Bludgeoned. She was bludgeoned by an axe. That's an awful way to kill someone. Yes. So, rightfully so, Diana was their suspect. They were working on investigating her checks. They found that her most recent checks were written to local department stores. And they pulled the receipts, and they found that her purchases included a blonde wig and an axe. Oh, shocking. But Diana continued to insist that her checkbook was stolen, and these were not her. Of course they weren't. So, they cross-examined the signatures on these checks with the signatures that the bank had on file for her. And they were a match. Of course they were. Yes, of course. The purchase records, rental car, disguise, and murder weapon were the smoking gun that the investigators needed. 
A co-worker had also told investigators that Diana recently told them that she was planning to perform a human sacrifice for a friend's upcoming birthday, and he picked the victim himself. Michael's birthday was only two weeks after Sherry's disappearance. Wait, what? Let me read that again. Yeah, read that again. What? A co-worker of Diana's told investigators that Diana had recently told them that she was planning to perform a human sacrifice for a friend's upcoming birthday, and he picked the victim himself. Can I just tell you that my birthday just passed and I fucked up because I didn't ask you to perform a human <laughs> sacrifice? I would have. I would have done that for you. I would never have asked you to do that. <laughs> well, That is the most fucked up thing I've ever heard. Yeah. So there were lots of statements from her coworkers that stated that Diana dabbled in witchcraft a little. Also, if you're going to perform human sacrifices, should you run around telling people? Probably not. I don't think so. And it just said it was a coworker. Like, it wasn't even, like, her best friend. I mean, I'm sorry, Allison. You'll never hear this, but I'm not performing human sacrifice for you. <laughs> no, no. I'm saying that she told a coworker. It wasn't like her best friend came forward and was like, hey, my best friend's going to perform a sacrifice. Like, she told her co-worker yeah. that she was performing a sacrifice. I don't know how I feel about that. Like, I'm sorry, but I don't share my deepest, darkest secrets with my co-workers. No, especially not about murder. Like, love you, Jenny, but I'm not going to tell you if I'm going to somebody. I mean, I will say, Allison and I do have a secret code. Okay, but she's your best friend. She's not your co-worker. Right. In case the... The... I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. You don't want to tell people your secret code anyway, so don't worry about it. I'm not going to tell them the secret code. I'm just saying we have a secret code in case the moment ever arrives that we need to use it. We have a secret code that the police will never figure out. Except they will. No, they won't. It's a damn good secret code. I know the secret code. You're not going to tell, though. I mean, no, but I'm just saying it's very uncharacteristic of you. Police are going to know that. Okay. Based Anyways. off of the uh, detective work we see in these crimes, I'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. It doesn't matter, because Allison and I are never going to actually kill someone. But we jokingly use it when our husband pisses us off. And that's rightfully so. Anyways, uh, many of her co-workers stated that Diana dabbled in witchcraft. So the story of the sacrifice wasn't super far-fetched. On August 1st, Diana was arrested for the kidnapping and the murder of Sherry Daly. Diana sticks to her story. Her checkbook was stolen. She was on a bike ride. She couldn't have done anything. Shortly after the arrest, a woman named Sally Lowe came forward to the police. She told them that she had a three-year affair with, Ma with Michael before Diana. She says that Michael was very unhappy in his marriage and blamed Sherry for all of their problems. So he wasn't a first-time offender. No. Well, you remember he was a player in high school. Yeah, so as I originally stated, Trash Bag was not going to give up player, player, playering, playing. What's the word I was looking for? Being a straight up player, piece of shit. Right. Yes, no, he did not give that up. So he blamed Sherry for all of their problems. He really resented her. And he would often say that he just wanted her to disappear. He wanted her gone. He wanted her dead. And he really wanted her to suffer. He even suggested to Sally that she should be the one to do it. He wanted Sherry stabbed and thrown off a cliff. Sorry, I heard you. I had myself muted because Jacob won't go shower. Yeah, I heard. I saw you like yelling. Yeah, I, saw but I thought you would shower. want to add something in here. So yeah, I mean, he's a piece of shit. Yeah, he is. He sucks. He wants her dirty and off a cliff. Dirty? Isn't that what you said? <laughs> no. <laughs> I said that he wanted her stabbed and thrown off a cliff. <laughs> I thought you said dirty, stabbed, and thrown off a cliff. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Clearly, I wasn't listening that closely. I said that he wanted her to suffer, and that he said that his girlfriend, Sally, should be the one to do it. So, rightfully so, Sally um, broke things off with Michael because he's a cuckoo bananas. Yeah, because she's not a fucking lunatic like uh, freaking Diana. Is her name Diane? Diana? Right. Diana. Freaking lunatic. So Sally hadn't heard from him since, but when she heard about Sherry, she knew that the police needed to hear the story. Obviously. So she Good job, Sally. Straight in. Yes. Thank you for coming forward. 
So this new development led police to believe that Michael orchestrated the murder of Sherry and Diana was just his pawn, as he once tried to get Sally to be. Mm -hmm. But other than this theory, they didn't really have any. So they started with his phone records, where they found numerous phone calls between Diana and Michael around the times that Sherry went missing. Days after Sherry went missing, Michael filed for separation. And within two weeks of her disappearance, he had started trying to cash in her retirement and her life insurance. He also started selling off her belongings within a couple weeks of her disappearance. All he was playing the grieving husband and keeping the suspicions off of him. How were the suspicions off of him, though? They clearly weren't watching him that closely. No, because he played the part so good, they didn't really look him. It doesn't seem like. I mean, they cleared him pretty quickly on. Yeah, I mean, it just seems pretty stupid to me, but okay. And, I mean, they had another suspect. They had the fake cop. So, they spent all of their energy looking at her. I guess. Um, also, he was, like, cashing in her life insurance policy, which, like, I don't know if I put it in here, but, like, that was, like, one of their, like, main arguments is that he was, like, doing it for the money. But her life insurance policy was only $50,000. That's pretty dumb. Like, I'm not saying any amount of money is a good but $50,000 ain't it. No, it ain't it. And also, like, if you're going to kill your wife off her insurance. Right. That was dumb. Yeah, he's an idiot. So. I mean, yeah, I agree. Not, I don't think any amount is, like, acceptable. No, but, like, 50000 Like, come on, dude. Yeah, you can do better. It's not even enough for, like, to pay off your debt that right. I'm sure you have. Yeah, no, do better. So the police um, questioned his coworkers, who really painted him in a bad light. They said Sally and Diana were not his only affairs. He actually had numerous affairs with other co-workers and hired copious amounts of sex workers. And he also did cocaine. Not that that's really relevant, relevant to anything, but it was in like every article I read that he did cocaine. So, looking real bad for Michael. But there was still no actual physical evidence that he had anything to do with Sherry's murder. So, investigators developed their theory. They believed that Michael told Diana where to go. Diana showed up in a disguise. Fake arrested Sherry. With her handcuffed in the back seat, Diana drove her to the remote area in the woods and viciously attacked her with a knife. What story do we think Diana gave her to arrest her, though? So, I saw two different um, things. One of them said that she, which I guess that does make sense with the cocaine that um they were they went to the house and they found cocaine at the house the kids were alone so they took both the kids into custody and like they were arresting sherry because she left the kids there by themselves with drugs in the house did she leave the kids by themselves though i don't know like i couldn't really find any like it was like you know like tmz articles like trash articles so i didn't really include that in here because i wasn't sure what was real right but that's kind of crazy like that she would go with them if she and they were little they were like eight eight and ten i think two boys at eight and ten i would not leave an eight and a ten year old alone especially not boys yeah i don't know that's weird go run my errands hmm. so, okay i don't know what else you got what was the other idea was that it i don't remember the other one it was stupid but that was, like, the main one that was in a lot of articles. But, like, they weren't, like, good, reputable articles. They were, like... I mean, that's where she left the kids alone. I could see that working. Yeah. But, so, it was also May May 6, 1996 was also a Monday. Right. So, she should have been in school. So, most likely the kids would have been in school if they were... I don't... They were either 6 and 8 or 8 and 10. Right. One of them was definitely 8. So, I don't know. But either way, one, of the, one article said that... um. The, that one story said that she was, like, worried about her kids, and that's why she went with the cop. So, I don't know. So, Diana drove her to the remote area and viciously attacked her with a knife, stabbing her numerous times while she was still handcuffed and buckled in the back seat. Diana then pulled her from the car to dump her body, but Sherry was still alive and started to fight for her life. Um, again, there were kind of, like, differences in how many times she actually got stabbed. Uh, I found one article that said, like, 8. One said 14. So, between 8 and 14 times, she was stabbed in the chest. And then she survived that. When she got pulled out of the car, she started to fight back with Diana. And so Diana took an axe to her head. I think it's awfully brazen to stab someone in the backseat of a rental car. Yeah. Pretty dumb, but okay. I mean, 
clearly they were not the smartest, Diana and Michael here. No. So, Sherry fighting back is what the scratches on Diana's head came from, not her bike accident. Well, I mean, obviously, we knew that was not, but we knew that wasn't true. <laughs> so, Diana took back to her head, she almost decapitated her, and after she was dead, she tossed her lifeless body into the ravine. And then Michael and Diana went about their life together. Real trash. Um, with the cops. Yeah, trash bags. With the theory and the circumstantial evidence on Michael, he was arrested for kidnapping and murder of his wife, Sherry. They both pled not guilty and quickly turned on each other. Diana kept the defense that her checkbook was stolen. And she was on that long bike ride at the beach. She couldn't have done it. Her defense team used the theory that Michael took the checkbook and used her name to frame Diana. He had one of his many other affairs carry out the murder. I don't think he was that smart. No, I don't either. I think he was an idiot. Okay. After four and a half days of deliberation, the jury found Diana guilty of kidnapping and will deliberate premeditated murder. And Diana was facing the death penalty. Michael's defense say that Diana acted alone, that she was just a crazy scorned ex-girlfriend who murdered Sherry out of jealousy because Michael went back to her. But Michael didn't go back to her because he was flaunting their affair and sleeping with her face on a pillow. Right. So, poor defense. Um, his lawyer, Robert Schwartz, said this plan was designed, conceived, and carried out by the psycho-crazed, whacked-out witch, Diana Hahn. Oh, okay. So, I just thought it was really, like, douchebaggy of him to, like, be like, she had to do it. She was a witch. Right. Like, I mean, if that's what she wants to do, if she wants to practice witchcraft, okay, cool. Like, that doesn't make her a murderer. No. It doesn't make her a I mean, murderer. Would, I think the fact but... that she openly talked about doing human sacrifices makes her a murderer. I mean, yeah, maybe. But no. I mean, witchcraft, no. I mean, it's not for me, but, you know, different structure, different folks. Right. I mean, if that's what she likes to do. Cool. Right. But anyway, so during Michael's trial, the prosecutors argued that Michael was just as guilty as Diana. It was well documented that he did want his wife dead. There were many witness testimonies that he regularly told people that he wanted out of his marriage, but he would never divorce Sherry. He would just kill her instead. Smart. The phone records were used to show how he was involved in the murder, and it was believed that he used these phone calls to guide Diana through the plan. Michael was found guilty on first-degree murder, kidnapping, and conspiracy. Mm-hmm. Both Michael and Diana received life sentences. They still deny involvement, and they blame each other. In 2000, Diana tried to get her conviction appealed, but her request was denied. A year later, in 2001, Michael tried to appeal as well, and he was also denied. So they both remain in prison. Are you frozen, or you said nothing else to say? You didn't say anything. That was it. That's the end of my story. I said, okay, interesting. And then you just, like, looked at me. I didn't hear that. Oh, I said it. I said, okay, interesting. Hmm. No, but that was it. So what happened to the kids? Um, they are with the grandparents. Michael's parents or Sherry's? I believe Sherry's. I mean, I think that would be better. But it, I was actually going to like add a little section here for the kids, but then I was like, they didn't really have much to do it with it, so my gosh, should I include them? Right. But no, the kids live with the grandparents. Um, they're adults now, obviously. So it happened in 96. Mm-hmm. But, um... One of the sons, I can't remember which one, still thinks that, like, his dad is innocent and has nothing to do with it. And he's done, like, interviews that he believes that his dad is innocent. And it was all Diana. And then the other son just, like, completely stays out of all of it. They also sued Diana Mm -hmm. for, like, you know, ruining their lives. Mm -hmm. And they won. And she owed them, like, $6 million. How's she paying that from prison? Uh, I don't think... There, are, like, is nothing that they ever got any of them. So I'm going to go with she's not. Okay. Okay, I can see, like, even if the dad didn't murder Sherry, he's still partially to blame, though. He brought Diana into their lives. Yeah, no, I agree. So, whatever. Okay. Yeah. They suck. Yeah. And Sherry just seems like a sweet little soul that did not deserve that at all. Right. So, yeah. Trash bags. You know, I just feel like regardless of what, like, any victim does, I don't know if they ever deserve to be murdered, though. No, they don't, but they just really murder him. In the room, I feel like we could be, like, they could be, like, she was a real piece of shit. She walked around kicking puppies. And she still would be, like, deserving of murder. 
No, really, there's nothing you can do really to be deserved to be killed. Other than maybe kill someone else. Well, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I just think it's so crazy to me. Anyway. Yeah, so that's all. Okay, well, that was a good bonus episode. Was it? Did you like it? I did. I like it when you leave me hanging, wanting to know what the hell's going on. (laughs) That's what I try to do. Okay, thanks for listening, Patroni. Okay, thanks, bye! Hey everyone, thanks for listening. If you liked what you heard and want to support a small podcast, please give us money at www.patreon.com forward slash weekly dose of wicked, where you can join one of our three tiers. At the $5 level, we've got the moderately wicked. For $7 a month, we've got the awesomely wicked. And for all of those high rollers, big ballers out there, we got the $10 level, the extraordinarily wicked. As a member of our Patreon, you are entitled to bonus episodes. Uh, You also get a one-time shout-out on our podcast, as well as some other cool little extra things going on there. So come on over. Join our fan club. Feel free to give us a follow on Instagram at weekly underscore dose underscore of underscore wicked or you can literally just search weekly dose of wicked and we'll pop up because we're the only ones for a direct feed of our podcast please go to www.weeklydoseofwicked.buzzsprout.com great news you can now listen to us pretty much wherever you like to listen to podcasts That's right, folks. We are big time. You can now hear your weekly dose of Wicked on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Plus Alexa, Podcast Addict, Podchaser, Pocket Cast, Deezer, Listen Notes, Player FM, Podcast Index, Overcast, Castro, CastBox, and PodFriend. The only place we can't seem to get ourselves on is Pandora. So we'll let you know when that happens. In the meantime, make sure to come back next Wednesday for your weekly, weekly dose, dose of, of wicked. wicked. But um. Psh.